So skincare is very confusing to me. I mean, we have so many products and so many active ingredients. Hyaluronic acid, retinol, tretinoic acid, niacinamide, vitamin C. Did I watch 100,000 YouTube tutorials on how to do your skincare? Yes. Did it make it less confusing to me? Mm. So whenever I'm confused about a thing, I like to look at the history because most probably a lot of the best of things that we have today is, is just how it's been done forever. And so I looked at the history of skincare and honestly, it just keeps on giving and giving. No wonder the beauty community is so full of drama because skincare history has always been full of drama. So let me share with you a little bit about that. Today we are serving... Simon Rocha Fall 2023, the Simon Rochification of coffee to go, if you will. Do I feel a little bit ridiculous? Mm, no, it's called fashion. Look it up. I also like how we're talking about skincare, but I don't even want to say how I glued this both to my face. All the beauty gurus will cancel me immediately. Yeah. So humans have been practicing skincare since 3000 BC and according to my calculations that's more than 5000 years. Isn't that crazy? It originated in ancient Egypt, at least we have the oldest knowledge of skincare routines dating back to ancient Egypt where they would mostly use products that would be readily available like olive oil, ostrich eggs, dough and essential oils. When we think about Egypt and skincare and beauty products, of course one person comes to mind and this is Miss Girlie Cleopatra. There's a lot of myths around what she was using. I think in total from all the articles I've read there must have been like a hundred different products that she was supposedly using. Of course we as a society tend to become obsessed with female celebrities and especially if it's a celebrity that lived 5,000 years ago the myths and the stories will become infinite to be honest. So one of the procedures that um, we think that Cleopatra was doing was taking baths in milk. You have different movies that showcase some of her procedures. Um, Monica Bellucci as Cleopatra definitely changed my brain chemistry forever. But more specifically, she was taking baths in donkey milk. And supposedly she had like 700 donkeys in her household just so that she can use their milk for her uh, beauty procedures. So donkey milk is supposedly good as a moisturizer because of its fatty acids and especially sour donkey milk. So donkey milk that went a bit bad has lactic acid, which is great as a natural chemical exfoliant. So getting rid of those dead cells from your skin and from your body. Other two main ingredients that Cleopatra would use were milk and grapes. She would often combine them for a facial also, she would use apple cider vinegar as a facial toner, rose water, goose fat, turpentine, almond oil, castor oil, celery, and hemp to soothe her eyes. As a lipstick, she would use red ochre with a little bit of fat. She would make a paste and apply it to her lips. Honestly, this is like a whole beauty routine at this point. And honestly, it wasn't just Cleopatra. A lot of women in ancient Egypt, especially wealthy women, would spend hours a day on their skincare routines. Because if you were wealthy, you wanted to be pretty as well. And of course, one of the most iconic things about the ancient Egypt beauty routine is the black eyeliner. They actually found a call applicator dating to 1000 BC. So that's like 3000 years old kind of eyeliner pencil. So it's like a stick made out of a black paste that they would use on their inner linings of their eyes. And I'm bringing it up because not only they used it as a fashion beauty statement, they also used it for medicinal purposes because it would protect the eyes from the harsh conditions that the climate where they were living had and also protecting the eyes from the sun supposedly. So here we have a nice uh, melange, I guess, between a beauty ritual that also has a medicinal aspect and skincare, I think, is also one of those weird topics which uh, also sits between cosmetics and medicinal purposes because we use skincare to look pretty, of course, to have nice glowing skin, but we're also doing it for our health, for the health of the skin. And so as we will see, the marketing strategies of skincare would exploit this idea of double purposes of skincare.
So now we're going to move to a different part of the world and most notably to China, 1760 BC, during the Shang Dynasty. At that time, pale skin was the rage and bleaching procedures were very common. I mean, even today, um, these kind of procedures are still prevalent and they did not come out of nowhere. They were present for thousands of years. Nowadays, this trend of having as pale skin as possible could be linked to the Western standards of beauty. Uh, but at that time, it was also linked with mostly as a status symbol. Because if you had a darker skin, it would mean that you are working in the field. And if you had pale skin, that would mean that you are spending your time mostly indoors. And that was what only wealthy people would do. Honestly, this is not a thing that was only present in ancient China. This is something that we will very soon see with Europeans as well a bit later on. So honestly, pretending to look more wealthy than you actually are is a thing in all cultures. And since wealthiness is also linked with social class, it would also be a way to upgrade your social class. So the three big pillars of ancient Chinese skincare were exfoliation, brightening, and moisturizing. Rice water was and is a big uh, skincare product. That means the water with which you wash the rice before cooking, you don't throw away, but you actually incorporate it into your skincare routine. Queens of sustainability, to be honest. The name of this water is Pan, and it has starch, vitamins, and proteins, which are said to be beneficial to the skin. Now, another big product that they would use would be uh, bath beans. And I know how that sounds. Um, and it's basically it. These are small tablets of soybean powder that they would throw in their bath, basically like a bath bomb. So soybeans contain a substance that is very similar in structure to estrogen, and estrogen is the female hormone. So it was thought at that time that it would make women prettier if they would absorb this substance through their skin. A big theory in ancient China was actually that you can replenish color with color, and so so for rosy chicks, for example, you would need to eat rose petals to be able to have that color in your system as well. And so a lot of the products would have flowers in them because of the colors that they would want to get on their faces. And then around 400 BC, they came up with lead mercurite. Yay! So this is basically a bleaching product to make their skin uh, whiter. The compound is used to target a specific type of the cells in your skin that are responsible to producing um, darker complexions. And the result would be that you would have whiter skin. Obviously, this is very toxic. And actually, it was found out that the Chinese were pretty much aware how toxic this substance is, but they prefer to continue using it for their desired effect. And honestly, I don't think we've become that much smarter nowadays with all of the crazy beauty trends and body trends that I'm seeing. Now, moving on to medieval times, as we know, the medieval people in Europe were not too keen on hygiene. It was mostly because they thought that um, infectious diseases would transmit through water. So they were literally avoiding water at all costs, like the plague. So instead, their skincare routines would be involved with combining pungent herbs with animal fat and applying this to their faces and to their bodies. Face masks were made with grinded seeds, leaves and flowers mixed with honey. During Renaissance, Da Vinci and the likes would use bread soaked in rose water to depuff their eyes in the morning after a long night of partying, I guess. And to treat acne, Mona Lisa would most probably use oatmeal boiled in vinegar. I mean, I think it paid off big time. So skin whitening procedures were not only present in ancient China, they were also present in Europe, as I've said. So in the Elizabethan era, they were putting a lot of powder on their skin. And because they were not using water, they were not taking this very toxic powder off their faces at the end of the day. And so when they would wake up, they would just 
put on even more powder and the next day even more powder and even more powder and obviously this would accumulate on their faces and in their bodies and would sometimes make sores and acne and basically wounds on their faces and because they wanted to cover it up they would use even more product on all of these open sores is it just wasn't really skincare at this point. The only form of skincare would be, I guess, um, so they would take baths uh, just very rarely, like two, three times a year max. Uh, and when they would want to take a bath and clean all of this powder that they would put on their faces, uh, it wouldn't come off, obviously, because of how much product is accumulated on their faces and so they would experiment with very many different liquids to try to take it off um, water wouldn't work so they were using alcohol beer sometimes even urine to try to take off as much product as possible it was just not a good time in general to be around So everything that we are discussing till now, all of the creams and all of the beauty procedures uh, were things that people were doing at home. Like the, the, there was no industry for it. So making your own skincare products was a skill that you would learn pretty much like cooking. You would prepare your meal for the dinner and you would also prepare your creams for the morning. Now this would start changing around the 19th century. Um, this is the post-scientific industrial revolution when things would start to be mass produced and sold to people. The only thing that saw industrial manufacturing and commercialization was the perfumery industry and honestly mostly in France because that is the only thing that it's pretty difficult to do on your own um, but everything else people would just make themselves at home. So around the 19th century, especially um, the beginning of the 20th century, the skincare manufacturers saw a very big boom. Um, not only because it could, but also because there was a very big demand. I mean, we've seen that um, humans were practicing skincare for thousands of years, so there was obviously a very big interest, but also a very important factor was that there was just a bigger visual awareness of how people looked. And this comes with the invention of electricity. First, of course, of the gas lamps and then of the electricity. So before that, people would not really pay attention that much to the way that they look because they could only see themselves in the mirror during good lighting. But now they have lighting 24-7. Also, the commercialization of photography uh, influences this, of course, because photography gets more accessible to people. And so now they can actually see how they look like, analyze how they look like, look at that photograph for hours and hours. So because of that, people just wanted to be prettier and we see a big boom in cosmetics as well but we also see a big boom in skincare. Skincare was also uh, becoming more accessible because water was becoming more accessible especially in the cities. Uh, we start having um, canalization, we stop having tap water, people's incomes also become bigger and so they would not only spend their money on food and clothes they would also start thinking on other things to spend their money on and skincare was a good opportunity as an industry to develop in this time. And some actors uh, would notice this very fast and would become key players in the industry very early on in history and would basically create the whole skincare industry and culture. And some of the things that we have today can actually be traced um, back to those decisions uh, that they were taking right at the beginning of the industrialization of skincare. So now I would like to talk about a very cool girly, one of the key players in how skincare developed, was created, and how it still is nowadays. This is Elena Rubinstein, and she would actually invent the types of the skin. Like she was the first one to categorize skin as like oily or dry or mixed. Um, she was the first one to say, okay, we need different types of creams, different types of products, depending on which type of skin you have. This is like in the 1900s. This is like more than 100 years ago. And we still use this categorization 
to this day. That's insane. So Elena Rubinstein was one of the first pioneers of the cosmetics industry. Uh, she was born in Poland, moved to Australia when she was 26 with pretty much no money and little English because she refused an arranged marriage. I mean, understandable. I really can't blame her. She had a few jars of homemade face creams in her luggage and she was noticed almost immediately for her stylish clothes and good skin. The girlie understood that there is a potential market very fast and that she could be the right person at the right time. The main ingredient of her creams was lanolin, which is like a fat coming from the wool of the sheep. And very conveniently, her uncle actually had a farm of sheep. so. Miss Gurley understood that this would be a perfect opportunity to create a business. Hard to believe that I'm actually standing right next to the premises of Elena Rubinstein's uncle's sheep farm. And that's because I'm not. That's in a completely different continent. So lanolin, one of the key compounds that Elena Rubinstein would use in her face masks was actually coming from the wolves of the sheep. But there was one problem. It stank really badly. And so Elena Rubinstein would experiment with different kinds of herbs and flowers to try to take away that stinky smell, like lavender and rose petals. She actually had a fight with her uncle, so the idea of him being her supplier of lanolin didn't really work. So she went and began waitressing, met an admirer who was willing to give her the funds to start her business. And she named the business Creme Valaz. So it cost 10 pence for her to make a cream, and she was selling them for 6 shillings. That was 86% profit. Are you kidding me? Actually, skincare is the most profitable part of the whole beauty industry because apparently it's very cheap to create the creams, especially mass produce them, and they sell you way, way, way more of a price. So honestly, skincare becoming so popular in the last few years just goes hand in hand with I think our capitalistic society, because if you have a business that can be so profitable, yeah, it makes sense to do it. And if you can sell things way more expensive than you should and still get away with it, um, people will do that. So Elena Rubinstein's business, as you can imagine, was very profitable. They opened the shop in Sydney, then she expanded to London, then to Paris, making it an international enterprise. And it's also nice to note that women at that time were not allowed to take bank loans. And so everything that she did was with her own money. It was also her that introduced the idea of skincare as science, being photographed in a lab with a lab coat. It's crazy how these images and how this marketing strategy is still present to this day. Skin hair is seen as something very scientific, very precise, something that is manufactured in a lab. And we don't really see this kind of imagery with cosmetics compared to skincare, although cosmetics is also manufactured in labs like this. Perfumery also is manufactured in labs. But when we think of perfumery, we think of um, flower fields and uh, celebrities on red carpets and romance stories and Kira Knightley on her motorcycle. And when we think about skincare, we think a lab coat and molecules floating around in the air. So Elena Rubinstein was basically responsible for this kind of imagery that we associate with skincare. And what's even more crazier is that she did not have any scientific training. So here we have another, I think, dark component of skincare that still carries on to this day is that a lot of the scientific terms and concepts that we see marketed to us are actually pseudoscience, but they just use the scientific terms so that they can have more legitimacy. So when the First World War broke out, she moved to New York, where she also opened a boutique in 1915. But in the States, she would have competition. Elizabeth Arden, who was also building her empire. There is actually a documentary um, documenting their rivalry. Basically, they are the queens of skincare that built skincare as we know it today. Two women, two immigrants in the US, throughout their life, they were mortal enemies. One quote from the documentary is that they were both keenly aware of effective marketing and luxurious packaging. The attraction of beauty 
politicians in neat uniforms, the value of celebrity endorsements, the perceived value of overpricing and the promotion of the pseudoscience of skincare. The rivalry with Arden lasted all her life, Rubenstein said of her rival, with her packaging and my product, we could have ruled the world. Elizabeth Arden, another very interesting lady, was kind of like the Miranda Priestley of her age. People working with her would say that um, whenever she would show up at the boutique, they would get a call beforehand and mayhem would commence. Everybody would start running around, applying lipsticks, putting on heels, making themselves pretty, um, throwing out all the trash, making everything look perfect. Because uh, Elizabeth Arden was she wanted everything perfect and people would say that when she would come and she would not like one of the employees how they would look like they could be just fired on the spot they, she could just be like that's all and then you go home and then you don't have a job anymore so going back to Elena Rubinstein unfortunately she paved the way to skincare in all the good ways but also in the bad ways so those things would be the exaggerated claims of their products, the pseudoscience aspect of it because she had no scientific training. She was also notorious about lying about her age and framing aging as a problem. One of her quotes and one of her mantras, I guess, that there are no ugly women, there are only lazy ones. And so obviously this kind of thinking is very problematic because it basically says that it's your fault and that she has the magical solution to it you just have to pay her so if you have a problem with your appearance just come to their boutique and they will fix it for you but she also put the grounds for individualized skincare um, so when you would go to her boutique you could also get a consultation from their beauticians in which you were prescribed um, specific skincare products uh, based on your specific needs and your specific skin type and I think this philosophy stuck to this day and I think this is one of the reasons that we have just so many products because there is this thinking that every skin on every person is just totally unique and needs a totally unique approach and a unique approach compared to a mass one of course would be more expensive. There is also a very great video that I watched about how companies make you buy a lot more skincare products than you need. A lot of these tactics that they employ now are the same that they were employing a hundred years ago. So you're being sold not only a beauty product, you're also being sold a beauty standard. These beauty standards should be perceived as achievable with their product, but in reality, it's, it's not achievable. So you keep buying their products in the hope that someday you will get to where they tell you you can get. And if it doesn't happen to you, well, it's because, I don't know, you're not doing the correct routine, you're not using them in the correct order, or um, look, we have like this new spectacular product, this for sure is gonna help you now. In the same video, a very interesting thing that they talked about was basically how a lot of the skincare products are the same thing, they just market it with a different name so that people can buy more stuff. So for example, a toner, a serum, and an essence, um, from a scientific point of view, is the same thing. Like scientists formulating these products would be confused themselves uh, of like what are what are we doing now like what what ah, okay what is a serum ah, okay so it's just like a toner right in terms of who was the first skincare company that appeared on the market it's very hard to pinpoint um most probably it could be shiseido in japan um it was opened in 1872 but the thing is that it opened as a pharmaceutical company and only later on, also in the beginning of the 20th century, it switched to um, skincare. And a very similar story is with the Kiel company, opened up as a pharmaceutical company um, and then switched to skincare. All in all, most of the skincare brands per se would appear at the beginning of the 20th century. And of course, we have Elena Rubinstein, Elizabeth Warden, we have Madame CJ Walker, who was specializing in products for hair and skincare for black women. You could make a whole video about her, like this stuff is so interesting. 
Revlon came about in the 1930s, as well as Avon, who started selling cosmetics around that time. Estelle Durr came a bit later in the 50s. Coco Chanel was pretty fast as well to delve into perfumery, cosmetics and skincare. La Mer was founded in the 50s, Mary Kay in the 60s. It's also very interesting to see all of these companies run by women. And you know how in the past people would just not allow women to do this stuff. And by people, I mean men, of course. But cosmetics and skincare was actually kind of given the green flag because skincare and cosmetics was perceived as something um, exclusively for women. And so it kind of made more morally acceptable for the people at that time to let women be in charge of these industries. And it would be considered acceptable for a woman to be in charge of a subordinate male employee, which was very controversial at that time. And now, of course, skincare is very successful as a sector. And so there is a lot more men in charge of the industry. I would really like to see how um, the ratio of women to men in charge of skincare products change from the beginning till today. I'm sure it's, it's there's definitely a change there. Because now in fashion, it's like what 90% of the creative directors are men. So basically men are telling us women what to wear. And so yeah, skincare in the 1900s was a thing run by women, for women, with women. And it's also very weird how men was just never a part of the consumer base for skincare, even though men also have skin. In general, the gender differences become more severe in the 19th century uh, because honestly before that we had men wearing makeup men wearing pink wearing very really beautiful clothes but something in the societal hive mind changed in the 19th century that everybody just decided that okay men should behave in this way and women should behave in that way and men should do these things and women should do other things and if they do the same thing then it's the end of the world and so skincare was unfortunately only limited to the women consumer base men are getting more and more interested in skincare nowadays but obviously it's very slow and everything that men would put on their face comes specifically in a black matte packaging otherwise the world will explode And then, of course, we have to talk about Korean skincare because at this point, it's just everywhere. It's just so iconic. I mean, nowadays, the Koreans are the innovators of skincare. And a lot of the companies in the Western countries would formulate their products with the help of Korean scientists and even work with Korean manufacturing plants to produce uh, their products. So Korean cosmetics started developing in the 1960s, shortly after gaining their independence, and also mainly because their government would uh, prohibit using any foreign products. And so they had to produce everything on their own. And so here is where the innovation in skincare began. In the Western world, uh, Korean skincare became more popular in 2011, when the BB cream was introduced to Western uh, consumer base. And the BB cream is like a a three-in-one cream that supposedly has everything that you need. Uh, this is a moisturizer, a foundation, and an SPF. Nowadays, skincare is the biggest part of the beauty industry in the world, sitting around 25% followed up by makeup with 19% and then perfumery with 9%. And as we've discussed before, it's also one that brings the most profit. There was another interview that I watched with someone that works in the skincare industry and they said, that the eye creams are just regular creams that are sold to you in smaller quantities with a bigger price but honestly it's just because it's labeled an eye cream it won't do miracles you can even go more extreme and say that well we don't need any skincare at all and a lot of people and a lot of scientists back this up if you look at all of the ingredients that are so trendy right now in all of the skincare products these are mainly things that your skin produces on its own. So for a lot of scientists and a lot of people, it doesn't make sense that we use so many cleansing products to take away all of our good chemicals that we produce by ourselves. And then we put on all of these products again by buying them in a tube. So then why take them off 
in the first place. I mean, moisturizer has been showing to lead to premature aging of the skin. So maybe there is a grain of truth in that. So yeah, skincare is very confusing even to this day. And as we've seen, it's because it was designed to be this mythical, very complicated, uh, very hyper specific thing that you need for your very hyper specific skin. And as we've seen, those scientific credentials sometimes are not even there. And obviously this video is not exhaustive. There's a lot more drama and a lot of more interesting, juicy pieces of history that could be discussed. For example, the rivalry between Revlon and Clinique in the 60s, in which Revlon basically stole all of Clinique's ideas and tried to sell them as their own. Let me know if you want me to go even more in depth. So I hope you like this little snippet of history of skincare. If you did, do please interact with the buttons below and see you in the next one. Bye!